Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the third physical awareness workshop of the second phase of the FTA's Comprehensive Corporate Tax Campaign and the first workshop specially dedicated to the real estate sector. My name is Roda Limheri and I will be your Master of Ceremonies for today's session. The introduction of the corporate tax is a significant development for the real estate sector. Application of corporate tax within the real estate industry involves many applications, exemptions, and relief depending on several factors. Today's workshop is very important and the FTA tax experts will provide the professional knowledge as well as answering your qu queries related to corporate tax and the real estate to provide you with the right understanding of your obligations and ensure your compliance. The workshop is an example of the FTA's ongoing support of taxpayers and the business community to raise the awareness of corporate tax applications and how it impacts their businesses. It is part of the FTA's commitment to provide focus awareness sessions and guidance to taxpayers to ensure self-compliance and help create the condition for business to thrive and achieve further growth. Today's agenda will include a presentation by FTA's tax policy team covering important topic, starting with an overview of corporate tax, followed up with the real estate and corporate tax for natural and juridical persons, Trans transitional rules in respect of immovable properties, real estate investment, investment trust, state sourced income, and at the end, we will allow for the Q&A session. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite Ms. Zahra Dahmani, Director of Taxpayer Services Department at the Federal Tax Authority to officially open the workshop with the keynote address. Please welcome her to the stage. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this Corporate Tax Awareness Workshop held by Federal Tax Authority, dedicated to the treatment of income from real estate activities. Today's workshop is part of our focused workshop series that is being implemented as part of the second phase of FTA's Comprehensive Corporate Tax Awareness Campaign that was launched in January 2024. Sorry, I have cold, so uh, I will apologize for my voice. The introduction of corporate tax in the UAE is a significant development for the real estate sector. It's crucial for real estate investors and businesses to understand the implication and plan accordingly to ensure the compliance. To ensure real estate owners understand how corporate tax applies to them. The FTA is conducting this specialized workshop to provide a comprehensive understanding of the corporate tax implications for the relevant stakeholders. The FTA has been working closely with the Ministry of Finance and the relevant stakeholders to ensure preparations are made to establish a seamless and effective corporate tax regime. We launched a comprehensive corporate tax awareness campaign since 2023 to help all taxpayers and all business sectors in UAE understand their obligations under the corporate tax law and encourage self-compliance. The first phase of the corporate tax awareness campaign, which was launched in 2023, included nine in-person workshops held across the UAE and focused on explaining the general principle of taxations of corporations and businesses. The campaign also comprised of 39 virtual workshops, both Arabic and English, to clarify the requirements and procedures for corporate tax registration to all those concerned. 
more than 13,600 participants, including taxpayers from business uh, sectors and tax uh, sector stakeholders, were benefited from these tax awareness sessions. In February and March of this year, we held a number of specialized workshops focused on explaining corporate tax for small and medium enterprises. In recognition of the vital role that those enterprises have in UAE, dynamic economic landscape, the workshop attracted the attendance of over 500 SMEs. Ladies and gentlemen, today's workshop will give an overview of the corporate tax law, highlighting the critical decisions and guidelines to further support your understanding and self-compliance. It will focus on the specific implications relating to income from real estate and will explain the tax requirements and regulations and how they apply to real estate investment for both juridical and natural person. We will discuss the applicability of corporate tax to both resident and non-resident individuals, natural persons, as well as for resident and non-resident juridical persons. We will also discuss relevant consideration when determining your taxable income, such as the election to account for gains and losses on realizations basis as well as depreciation. An important point to remember is that regardless of the level of income generated by a company, it's mandatory to register for corporate tax in the UAE. So the compliance with the tax regulations is essential. The FTA has launched its registration channel for corporate tax through Imara Tax Portal in a phased manner in 2023. Therefore, I would like to call on all persons required to register for corporate tax to proactively register and obtain a tax registration number. The FTA decision number three of 2024, which came into effect in 1st of March 2024, has specified the deadlines to apply for corporate tax registration for various taxpayers, including natural and juridical person, both residents and non-residents. Therefore, I would urge all companies incorporated in the UAE before 1st of March 2024 who are subject to corporate tax and hold licenses that were issued in January or February of any year to submit their corporate tax registration applications no later than 31st of May 2024 in order to avoid any administrative penalties. So registration is available 24 by 7 through the Emara Tax Portal with a clear and straightforward registration process. In addition to that, FTA has recently expanded the channels for submitting corporate tax registration by making it available at 23 government services centers across the country. I also would like to highlight that all publications, decisions, and regulations related to corporate tax and taxations, as well as the exemptions applicable to real estate owners and investors can also be viewed through FTA website. The website also provides guides, manuals, and videos, tutorial detailing the compliance requirement for corporate tax and the registration process. Ladies and gentlemen, the FTA's mission is to encourage voluntary compliance with the corporate tax law through fair and transparent policies in line with the international best practices. At the FTA, we are committed to keeping the business community fully informed of corporate tax requirements and stand ready to provide guidance and education tailored to the needs of specific taxpayers category, like real estate owners. 
Thank you for joining us today. I wish you a productive workshop ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Zahra Dahmani, for the insightful speech and valuable information about corporate tax and the FTE's rule. Now, allow me to introduce Rida Hamzawi, tax policy senior expert, Christine Awad, tax policy expert, Zubair Chaduri, tax policy specialist, and Juliana Candido, tax policy expert, who will give us an overview of cor about corporate tax, then move to more focused topics on the application of corporate tax within the real estate sector for natural and juridical persons. Please welcome them to the stage. Thank you uh, very much, Your Excellencies, for your time and uh, for attending this uh, session on uh, corporate tax awareness for the purpose of the uh, taxation of real estate uh, income or income from real estate activities or activity connected to real estate. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again also uh, for your dedication and for following the uh, corporate tax awareness provided by the FTA. So uh, for this uh, session today, we will cover these uh, topics. And uh, let me just set the stage for the uh, technical uh, element of the presentation by talking to you about the uh, key policy drivers, role of the FTA in the implementation of corporate tax, corporate tax timeline, and also the uh, corporate tax uh, law and legislation framework. So basically, the um, Key uh, policy drivers for the introduction of corporate tax, they revolve around these four uh, elements. The first one is to introduce a competitive uh, corporate tax regime based on international best practices. The aim mainly is to uh, consolidate the position of the uh, UAE as a regional and international uh, business and investment hub for uh, parent companies, for holding companies, uh, and uh, for uh, you know, uh, also uh, achieving the uh, diversification of the also the revenue sources for the uh, UAE government, which will allow to accelerate the development and transformation of the UAE. Most importantly, the purpose of the corporate tax, uh, introduction of corporate tax, is to consolidate and confirm again the commitment of the UAE to uh, implement international standards and also fight uh, harmful tax practices by consolidating uh, transparency and enhancing substance. The um, role of the FTA basically consists in the administration of um, the federal tax in the UAE, so of course VAT, excise and uh, of course corporate tax. Also the role of the FTA revolves around f four uh, uh, key uh, elements or key pillars so the first one is to support the compliance of the taxpayer and of course the FTA is uh, providing guidance by issuing um, tax guides, by issuing uh, public clarifications. Also provide tax technical support to taxpayer by uh, you know, um, giving its opinion on specific tax matters, specific tax situation through the private clarification process and the, uh, our you know, speakers today, they will talk about also private clarification because many of you, of course, they will have a lot of questions related to their specific position. So we will talk about, of course, how to apply for private clarification, what needs to be met in order for the FTA to process private clarification requests. The FTA is also the collection body responsible for um, you know, facilitating the compliance, the filing, and the uh, collection of taxes. And of course, the uh, enforcement role uh, of the FTA as any tax authority, the FTA is uh, responsible for conducting tax audit and reviewing the, uh, uh, you know, the compliance of uh, corporate tax uh, payers and if needed, apply, uh, applying penalties. 
If we look at the corporate tax um, timeline, uh, so basically the announcement of the corporate tax regime uh, was in January 2022. In October 2022, uh, the uh, federal corporate tax law was issued and then the FTA launched the uh, early uh, corporate tax registration campaign uh, around May, uh, mid-May 2023. And then, uh, so almost one year ago, and 1st of June 2023 marks the uh, you know, entry into effect of the corporate tax law and also the starting of the first uh, CT uh, period for taxable person with a financial year uh, or a tax period going from uh, 1st of June to uh, 31st of May. And then 1st of January 2024 is very likely for most uh, taxable person it will be the uh, first tax period with a taxable person uh, having a calendar year as a financial year. And then we have um, 31st of May 2024, which marks the end of the first city period for taxable person with a period starting on 1st of uh, 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 June 2023. And then 31st of December 2024, it marks the end of the first uh, city period for taxable person having uh, tax period corresponding to the calendar year. The first filing deadline for uh, corporate taxpayer with a tax period going from June till 31st of May will be 28th of February 2025. And then for most taxpayer, I think the, of course, the uh, filing deadline will be end of September 2025. And those taxpayer are those having a uh, tax period corresponding to the uh, calendar year. The um, legal framework for the corporate tax, of course, the corporate tax law was issued by uh, His Highness President of the UAE, federal decree law, and then the federal decree law, the corporate tax law refers to various cabinet decision and also ministerial decision. We have also FTA decision, a certain number of FTA decision that have been issued and FTA decision that are issued by the chairman of the board of director of the Federal Tax Authority. FTA also issued uh, many uh, corporate tax guides. So up to now 16 corporate tax guides uh, have been issued. The last ones are the ones dealing with uh, business restructuring relief and transfer within qualifying groups. So article uh, 27 and article 26 of the corporate tax law. And uh, 10 of these guides have been already translated into uh, Arabic, so they're available in both languages. And then, of course, FTA published uh, public uh, clarification and uh, I think many uh, guides and many also public clarification uh, are yet to come. So for the guides, I think in the next few weeks, we will see uh, around five key guides, uh, I think, will be uh, published. Um, a very important element, uh, I think it was mentioned by um, Zahra Dahmani, Director of Taxpayer Services, is the corporate tax registration. The first step for the compliance with the corporate tax law is the registration for corporate tax. FTA published a decision with uh, specific deadlines for the registration. The decision applies to a uh, juridical person and to natural person, it applies to uh, resident and non-resident, and there are specific rules depending on when you become a taxable person, and I think we have dedicated slides to talk to you about the corporate tax uh, registration and to explain how uh, these rules, you know, uh, related to FTA decision number three of 2024 should be implemented. And again, uh, let me highlight that registration is a must and it's the first step in terms of uh, compliance with the corporate tax uh, regulation. Again, thank you uh, very much for your time and I leave the floor for my colleague, I think Christine, to talk to you about a key element of the corporate tax law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frida. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Christine. I'm one of the experts in the um, Tax Policy and International Relations Department. So what I wanted to go through today is really just some of the key elements of the corporate tax regime. 
So uh, one of the first things they have to do is identify if you're a taxable person. So if you are subject to corporate tax in the UAE. So we break that down being either a natural person or a juridical person. Then I'll go through some of the corporate tax rates that apply to those people, um, as well as tax periods. And then as uh, Rita alluded to in Zahra, um, corporate tax registration, the recent FTA decision that was issued. So to start off with, the first thing that you need to consider in order to figure out whether or not the corporate tax law actually applies to you is whether or not you are a taxable person. So a taxable person just means someone who is subject to corporate tax in the UAE. So you are either a juridical person, so that's a legal entity, um, or a natural person. So an individual person, someone who is alive, um, regardless of what your age is, or actually where you reside. So a natural person can either be a resident person or a non-resident person. And uh, my colleague uh, Zubair will go into further details about what the difference is for natural persons between someone who's resident and someone who's non-resident in the UAE. The same thing applies for juridical persons, so it's important to understand if you're a juridical person, if you are a resident person or a non-resident person. And we'll go into a lot more detail around those. Um, but the key thing here is real estate for both juridical persons and natural persons is subject to corporate tax in various scenarios. And what we'll do is go through many examples of the types of ownership and things like that that you may um, have or um, your clients may have, and then how they are taxed in the UAE. Now, most of you have heard about the corporate tax rates. So there's either the 9% standard corporate tax rate or there's the 0%. So it's really important that once you identify what type of taxable person you are and whether you're resident or non-resident, the rates that are applied to you. Now, for the purposes of real estate income, um, and let's just assume that you don't have any other business. For real estate income, these are the rates that apply. So regardless of whether you're a natural person or juridical person, whether you're resident or non-resident, it's actually quite simple. So for all those different categories, the first 375,000 dirhams of your taxable income is going to be subject to 0%. Anything above the 375,000 dirhams of taxable income is going to be subject to 9%. Now the key thing here is that it applies to your taxable income, not your revenue, it's your taxable income. And there's a calculation that we'll go through in terms of how you determine and the relevant factors in terms of calculating what your taxable income is. But for now, it's going to be 0% for your first 375,000, which means that effectively your first 375,000 of taxable income is tax-free. Everything above that then is subject to 9%. Now this is slightly different to VAT. So everyone's aware of the 375,000 threshold for VAT. That's a registration threshold. For corporate tax purposes, even if you, it's really if you're a taxable person, you are required to register. The threshold is only the tax-free component of your taxable income. So it's clear to understand the difference between those two. Okay. So tax periods, this is a really important concept as well because you have to identify what is the tax period, the period at which you are subject for, for tax. Now this is again slightly different. So for VAT, and I'll, I'll highlight a few differences between corporate tax and VAT just because that's something most people are aware of, but also there's, there's similar concepts but quite different at the same time. So for corporate tax, everyone has a tax period and that's based actually just for simplicity on the financial year that applies to you as a business or a natural person. Now, uh, Zubair and Juliana will go into what's a tax period for a natural person versus a juridical person, but generally it's a 12 month period that aligns with your financial year. And that period can actually be longer or shorter just depending on the period, but generally it's 12 months. Um, for a natural person, your tax period is the Gregorian calendar year. It will always be the Gregorian calendar year. So January through to December. For juridical persons, there's various factors, but that's the financial year that applies to you for accounting purposes. It's going to be a 12 month period. And there are times when you can either increase or decrease that. And there could be certain reasons why you want to change the length of your tax period. So for instance, you may want to um, uh, benefit from a tax group and so in order to join a tax group, you have to have the same tax period as the parent company. Um, you may be adjusting your financial year for accounting purposes um, or for other legis um, legislative or corporate commercial reasons why you want to change your tax period. 
Um, but for that period, you'll either have a shorter or a longer period, but in the end, you'll always end up having a 12-month tax period. And for tax periods, that's generally going to be the period that you're also going to be preparing your financial statements. So for corporate tax, we've tried to make it as easy as possible by not requiring you to have a different period from your financial statements. So we're always going to be following your financial statements, which is also the start of your taxable um, income calculation. Now we've spoken a lot, Zahra and Vira um, uh, spoke about registration. This is the first step in terms of um, uh, your compliance requirements for corporate tax. So FTA issued a decision, number three of 2024, which actually provided deadlines by which different categories of taxable persons need to register. So once you've identified what taxable, type of taxable person you are, it's also important to understand if you are a resident person or a non-resident person, and then there's specific rules depending on if you're a juridical or non, um, or a natural person. So here I'll just go through some of the deadlines for natural persons. So the first thing and, and the simple consideration for natural persons is, are you a resident person or are you a non-resident person? Zubair will explain what that is on the scenarios um, where you can be a non-resident person, but generally if you're a resident person, that's a natural person, so an individual, you're required, your tax period is going to be the Gregorian calendar year, so January through to December. And what we're saying is that if you are uh, become a taxable person in that year, so that's if you meet the conditions of being a taxable person, so you conduct a business or a business activity, and you exceed the turnover threshold of a million dirhams during that period, then you're a taxable person, you're subject to CT and you're required to register. And you actually have until the 31st of March of the following calendar year to register. So if your first tax period for natural persons is the 2024 Gregorian year, then you have until 31st of March 2025 to register. For non-resident persons, it's slightly different. So if you conduct a business or business activity as a non-resident person um, and you exceed the threshold in that tax period, then you have three months from the date of fulfilling the conditions of being a non-resident um, taxable person to register for CT. And Zubair will explain that a little bit further. Oops. Okay, for juridical persons, again, it's dependent on whether you're resident or non-resident, but then there's also a consideration here. So if you were incorporated established or otherwise recognized prior to the effective date of the decision, which is 1st of March 2024, then there's specific um, uh, sort of timelines by which you register based on your license issuance month. And I'll go through a table um, shortly that was in the decision about, you know, if your license was issued in this month, then what's the due date for that? But if you uh, were incorporated, established or otherwise recognized before, the effective date, so 1st of March, then you have to follow the monthly um, schedule. If you didn't have a license at the date, so say for instance you were incorporated, but you actually hadn't gone and got your commercial license, then you have three months from the effective date of the decision to register, so by the 31st of May. If you were incorporated or registered after the effective date, so say for instance you established yourself today, then you actually have three months from today to submit your registration application. So those are the three uh, types of scenarios for a, no, uh, a resident juridical person. One of the things that we did want to highlight here is if you are a taxable person that has multiple licenses, say for instance you have different businesses, you have to look at the earliest license that you have by the month and the year um, to decide which is the relevant license date that you're going to use, and then it's going to be based on the month that that decision was issued, uh, that license was issued, sorry. So here I'll just go through just sort of the table that we set the sort of the timelines for different um, uh, uh, license dates. So the key thing here is you look at your license, say for instance it was issued in uh, February of 2016. What you do is go straight here to February and your um, registration application is due by the 31st of May. If you have a license that we issued, say for instance in August, then the deadline for submitting your registration application is the 31st of October. So that's where you're a resident person. For non-resident persons, um, then there's the three scenarios. So 
It depends again on whether or not you have a permanent establishment or if you are a non-resident juridical person by virtue of having a nexus in the UAE. And Juliana will go into what those conditions are or those scenarios are um, a little bit later. But just to highlight here, so if you have a permanent establishment, then the first thing that you need to do is look at when, um, if that permanent establishment, so if, say for instance, you had a permanent establishment already by the effective day of the decision, so 1st of March, then what you're required to do is submit a registration application within nine months from the existence of the permanent establishment. So what we mean by existence is that you have not, uh, you, it's when you recognise your permanent establishment in the UAE that when it was subject to CT, so subject to corporate tax. So you could only be subject to corporate tax from the effective date of the implementation of the corporate tax law. So from 1st of June 2023, you then wait for the nine month period uh, or the six month period, sorry, to see if you have established a, um, a permanent establishment here, and then you start calculating the nine months. So you have nine months from then. So the earliest you could have had a permanent establishment that was subject corporate tax was um, the 1st of December. So it goes on for, um, for when you st first started, and that's for permanent establishments that existed before 1st of March. For permanent establishments that existed or started after March, then again, you have to wait the six month period to determine whether you've established your, um, uh, your, your permanent establishment and you have to apply for registration within six months of that date. Then the other category is whether or if you have a nexus or not. So if you have a nexus, and Juliana will explain what that means, before the 1st of March, then you have to apply for registration by the 31st of May, 2024. If you have a nexus after the 1st of March, then you have three months from the date of establishing that nexus to register for corporate tax. So the key thing here that I wanted to go through is just identifying whether you're a natural person or juridical person, and then the effective date by which you have to um, uh, submit your registration application. Now what we'll do is Zubair will actually go through a lot more detail now about being a taxable person that's a natural person and the different scenarios in which you will be subject to CT. So I'll just pass on to Zabir now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Good morning, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here today. So I'm going to be talking about natural persons and income from real estate. So first, we are going to look at natural persons generally before we take a deep dive into real estate and go through and work through a number of examples together. So when is a natural person subject to corporate tax? As Christine just mentioned, there is business or business activity that they must conduct. That's the first test. And when they are conducting business or business activity, then their turnover needs to exceed one million dirhams and that's per tax period. So given that the tax period for natural persons is always a Gregorian calendar year, so the 1st of January to the 31st of December, the one million dirham turnover threshold applies per tax period. In terms of their tax base, so what is included in that turnover? What are natural persons taxed on? It's their business or business activity which is conducted in the UAE. That also will include income from outside the UAE as long as it is in relation to the business which is being conducted in the UAE. As per Article 11 of the Corporate Tax Law, it's considered to be resident for a natural person if they are conducting business in the UAE, business or business activities. So even if someone is based outside of the UAE, if they have a business here, they're conducting business here, they are considered a resident person. There are some rare instances where a natural person will be outside of the UAE, and if they're, as per applicable DTAs, double tax agreements, they'll be considered as non-resident, then they may have a permanent establishment in the UAE and the same thresholds will apply to them.
Christine mentioned the tax rates uh, just a moment ago, um, with 0% up to 375,000, and beyond that, 9%. Now, the key point to remember for natural persons is this is on their taxable income. The first step that we just mentioned is on turnover. Turnover is what is considered and brings someone within the scope of corporate tax. But when we are considering how much corporate tax is due and the calculation for corporate tax, we are looking at taxable income. And so their accounting profit of a natural person will be adjusted as per Article 20 of the corporate tax law and we will arrive at the taxable income. And that is what the 9% or 0% and then the 9% is applied to. And as I just mentioned, the tax period. So the tax period for natural persons will always be the Gregorian calendar year. So for natural persons, the introduction of corporate tax was on the 1st of June 2023, but the first tax period will be the 1st of January 2023 to the 2024, sorry, to the 31st of December 2024. The only instances where a tax period may be shorter is if there's a cessation of business or business activity, in which case you will have to deregister, and Christine will go on to mention how deregistration happens as per the CT law. But the, the basis is, for natural persons, the tax period will always be the 1st of January to the 31st of December, irrespective of financial years or how accounts may, may, be, may be made up, the tax period will always be the full calendar year. So are there any exclusions for natural persons? There are. Cabinet Decision 49 specifies three categories of exclusions. And the way the exclusions operate are that they are not considered for the purposes of the one million dirham threshold. So anything which is covered by salary and wages, personal investment income, or real estate investment income, they will not be considered as part of that one million dirham turnover threshold. And also they won't be considered for taxable income. We will go into detail today on real estate investment income and look at some examples, as I mentioned, and how that will interact firstly with the turnover and secondly, with the corporate tax rates. In terms of registration for natural purposes, uh, persons, so if there is no business or business activities conducted by the natural persons, or if they conduct business and business activities but they do not reach that one million dirham threshold, then they will not have to register. They will not be in scope of CT. Now, one point to mention is if, say for example, in 2024, and this year, they have turnover which exceeds the one million dirham threshold. So they're a taxable person, they have to register for CT. And next year, in 2025, it drops, their turnover drops below one million dirhams. So what happens then? Well, in those instances, they will have to file a nil return. There won't be taxable income, even if, they, if their taxable income, for example, is 500,000 or the turnover, sorry, is 500,000, half a million dirhams, because they have not reached the threshold of 1 million dirhams, they will not have to submit a, uh, a full CT return. They will just submit a nil CT return. And the reason for that is because they will have already been registered for corporate tax. So these are the exclusions that I mentioned, and these are the ones which are excluded from turnover in calculating whether a natural person has reached the one million dirham threshold. So the first is salary and wages. So that's any compensation which is received from an employer. So that can be in cash, it can be uh, an in-kind benefit, anything which is at an arm's length, as a transaction would need to be, that it reflects the market value, those salaries are not considered for the turnover. The second is personal investment income. And so if there are any activities, for example, trading of, of stocks and shares where there is no license required and they do not hold a license, 
and also it's not considered to be a commercial business within the commercial transactions law, then that is also uh, not considered for the purposes of the one million dirham threshold. Now importantly for today, we've got the real estate investment income. And this will also be out of scope if it, meet the con if it meets the conditions in cabinet decision 49. So if there is any investment derived by natural persons, which is directly or indirectly the selling, leasing, subleasing, and renting of land or real estate property, that will be excluded as per cabinet decision 49. It should not be conducted through a license, nor required to be conducted through a license. So simply not having a license will not, will not fix the situation. If a license is required, that is the test. If a license is required and you hold a license, then that is not considered for the exclusion. If a license is required but you don't hold one or you're in the process of getting one, that income is still to be considered for the purposes of the one million dirham threshold. So let's work through a number of examples, practical examples, to consider how does this work in a number of different situations. So the first example is a natural person, Mr. T, who holds residential apartments. Now, he hires a company, Company C. It's unrelated to Mr. T, and the role of Company C here is to find tenants, to collect rent, and then remit that rent to Mr. T. Now, given that Company C manages the properties, if they have a license or not is not relevant to the situation. The test is Mr. T. Does Mr. T have or require a license? In this situation, he does not, and so the income that he receives will be considered as real estate investment income, and it will be excluded for the purposes of considering the threshold for turnover. Another example, and this is considering a sole establishment. So here we have Mr. P. He owns several apartments uh, across the UAE and rents them out. He does not conduct any other business at all. And he has created a sole establishment through which he rents and manages his apartments. And the sole establishment for the purposes of CT is not considered, as, is not considered to have a separate legal personality. So the sole establishment is considered uh, the same with Mr. P. And there is a license held. The license is held, whether it's by Mr. P or the sole establishment, is irrelevant. It will be held as it would be considered by a natural person. And for that reason, given a license is held, it will not be real estate investment income. And there's some figures here, and this is just to, to highlight and to show how the turnover and taxable income interact with one another. So the annual rental income here is 1.2 million dirhams, and the costs are 300,000 dirhams. Now the important point is the turnover. The turnover is in excess of 1 million dirhams. Although the accounting income is below, it's 900, that's not considered whether they're within the scope of corporate tax. They are brought into the scope of corporate tax because they've crossed the one million dirham threshold. So here, the accounting income is 900,000. That's a 1.2 million dirham threshold uh, turnover with the 300,000 deduction. And his taxable income with no further adjustments is the 900,000. As Christine mentioned earlier, with the CT rates, we have 0% for the first 375,000 on the taxable income, and the remainder is taxed at 9%. Another example, here we have uh, Mr. N. And Mr. N has real estate, 
real estate properties. He has plots of land also in the UAE, which he rents out. And he does not have a license for his rental income, and neither is he required to have a license. He does, however, have a license for his other business. He has a business, uh, a furniture business. Now, the fact that he holds a furniture business does not constitute a, a license relevant to the real estate and the real estate investment income. So the holding of a license in itself is not conclusive that someone um, will be taxable and it won't be subject to the real estate investment income exclusion. It's whether that license is relevant to that real estate investment activity. In this situation, if Mr. N has, and he has passed a threshold of one million um, for his business, selling furniture, then he would be subject to, to corporate tax, but only for that furniture business, not in relation to his real estate. So even if the real estate exceeds one million, it will be excluded as per cabinet decision 49 and not considered for the purposes of corporate tax. Now, here we have Mr. X, a slightly different situation where a property owner has set up a company and they hold all the shares themselves. Now, the company has a license to manage the property. And we're told that the annual rental income is two million. So this company, it collects the rent, it manages the tenants, and it charges a fee to Mr. X. And some of you will know, as it's a related party, any fee that it charges will have to be at an arm's length basis. Now here, slightly different to the earlier example, the company has a separate legal personality. So what does that mean? It means that for, for Mr. X here, the income that he receives from the company will be considered real estate investment income. He does not hold a license. He is not required to hold a license. There is an entity here which is a separate legal person which has a license. So in this example, Mr. X, the income he receives from real estate will not be considered for corporate tax and will be excluded specifically under the cabinet decision. Example five, and this example is going to look again at licenses. So we have an individual, natural person, Mr. V, who has land that is used for parking. And he receives income from his real estate, from the parking, uh, which he charges rent for. And he receives income of 1.1 million dirhams. Now, this individual in this example has not obtained license. However, the relevant laws and regulations state that he does require a license for this activity. So in this example, the fact that he does not hold a license is not relevant. He is required to. And as we mentioned earlier, the definition of real estate investment income, given that a license was required and is required, this will not be excluded. In this situation, Mr. V will have to consider this income as part of his turnover to consider whether he is within scope of CT. And as we know, the annual rental income, which will be considered as part of his turnover, is 1.2 million dirhams. And as such, they would have to register irrespective of whether they hold a license or not, because they are required to hold a license. Family foundations. So family foundations is a concept as per Article 17 of the corporate tax law. There may be a number of different entities which are used to avail the treatment of family foundations. And just to take a step back, the way family foundations operate, if the conditions under Article 17.1 of the corporate tax law are met, then the family foundation, the entity itself, can be treated as transparent. And so any income received by the Family Foundation flows through to the underlying beneficiaries. And that is what we have in this example here. We have a Family Foundation 
with a family as beneficiaries of that entity. So the Family Foundation does not have a license nor is required to have a license. The beneficiaries here, which are natural persons, do not have a license and are not required to hold a license. So any income, any re uh, real estate investment uh, income which is received will be considered as real estate investment income which is excluded for the purposes of considering the turnover for those natural persons. And this example just highlights the interaction of the exclusion under CD49 with other aspects of the corporate tax law. In this example, we have Mr. Q who owns a hotel building and he enters into a contract with a licensed hotel management company, one which he is not related to. And they plan to operate a hotel establishment. So Mr. Q leases, as we mentioned, the definition does cover leasing. He leases the hotel, the building, to the hotel management company and he receives an annual lump sum on this lease. Now, they will carry out a hotel business and they are considered a completely separate taxable person. Mr. Q here, he's not uh, engaged in the business. He's not engaged in the operation of the hotel at all. And so the real estate income here would be the annual sum which Mr. Q receives. There is no license. There's no license to be required. And so this will be considered as real estate investment subject to the exclusion. And the last example will be a split portfolio. So here, Mr. Y owns seven different apartments and there are mixed uses for these apartments. So five of them are considered as holiday homes and the relevant emirate requires a license to be held for these properties, for renting these properties out. There is a sixth property, which is his personal property, and a seventh is one single property which is let out on a yearly basis under a Najari contract. Now, we're told here Mr. Y has mortgage interest of 280,000 dirhams and that is split across the seven properties. Before that, we'll consider how do each of these categories of real estate, uh, what's, the, what's the impact of these for the natural person? And we will consider these separately. So first of all, we've got the five holiday homes. They have uh, an income generated of 2.1 million dirhams. A license is required, a license is held. This will not be excluded as per Cabinet Decision 49 for the purpose of real estate. This will be considered in the turnover as to whether it exceeds 1 million. And as we're told, it does. It's 2.1 million dirhams. So this is taxable and it's not excluded. Then we have the, the personal apartment which they hold for themselves. Of course, there's no income for this and that is not within the scope of CT. The seventh property does not require a license and neither is a license held. So this specific property and the rent received from this property is outside the scope. It's specifically excluded as per cabinet decision 49. And as I mentioned, the interest expenses of 280,000, we now need to consider what is the impact of this. The whole 280,000 are not deductible. On, this, on the assumption that the, the interest is equal for all of the seven properties, two sevenths are not going to be deductible. One seventh is because this is personal property, and one seventh because that seventh property, which is on a contract not requiring a license, is not within the scope of CT. So it is those five first properties where a license is held, where it's within the scope of CT, the interest expenses for those are considered to be deductible. 
So the five sevenths of the 280,000 would be 200,000. So what are the corporate tax implications? So we've crossed the threshold of 1 million dirhams. Now we consider the taxable income. And as I mentioned, the 1 million threshold goes away. And we look at the corporate tax rates, 0% up to 375,000 and 9% beyond that. We've calculated that 200,000 is deductible. And so this will mean only those first five properties will be subject to tax and tax, taxable income on those properties having the income of 2.1 million, the deduction of 200,000, so the income which is taxable will be 1.9 million dirhams. That brings me to the end of the examples. So thank you very much. I hope you found the different scenarios useful and it just illustrates the different points and interactions with different areas of the corporate tax law. To take away from this part of the presentation, just remember the, the different points and the different steps which are considered. So the first is the turnover and that is where the exclusion will bring out any real estate investment income and then once, if the threshold is still exceeded above 1 million dirhams, that's when you turn to the tax rate on taxable income after adjustment for corporate tax. Thank you very much. I will pass back to uh, Taruda. Thank you very much. Thanks to our expert for the great information. We will now take a short break for 30 minutes, but let me highlight that outside the room in the main hall, FTA has allocated an information desk that you can reach out if you have any questions or need assistance with any corporate tax and registration matters. They are here to assist you. See you back in 30 minutes. Welcome back everyone. We hope you had a refreshing break. Please welcome back Rida Hamzawi, uh, Christine Awad, Zubair Chaduri, and Juliana Candido to uh, complete and continue their presentation on corporate tax for real estate. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so now in the second part of the presentation, I'm going to start uh, providing you further detail on what is the treatment for juridical persons. In the first part, we covered natural persons, individuals, and now we are going to treat uh, how juridical persons will be taxed in the context of real estate uh, income. Uh, first, uh, I would like to um, explain in more detail how we're going to define who is a resident person for the purpose of uh, UAE corporate tax when it comes to juridical persons. So generally, when we are talking about juridical persons, we are talking about legal entities, companies and other types of legal entities. So the first rule in general for defining who is a juridical person for legal purposes is where the juridical person is incorporated or otherwise established. If it's established in the UAE, this is the first rule, automatic rule, we will be considering this legal entity as resident in the UAE. And it's important to note here that we are going to consider resident in the UAE, uh, juridical persons incorporated under the mainland jurisdiction, mainland UAE legislation, as well as any free zone legislation. So we are also considering as entities established in the UAE free zones as EUAE juridical persons. And the second scenario is the case of juridical persons that are effectively managed and controlled in the UAE. So it might be the case, especially in the UAE as a financial hub, that you have a jurisdictions a and juridical persons incorporated in a different country, but they are effectively managed and controlled in the UAE. So they are going to be considered as well as juridical persons for UAE purposes. And when we are talking about effectively managed and controlled in the UAE, we, we're gonna provide a 
practical tests. So the first uh, step of the test is to analyze the facts and circumstances. This could be, for example, a case of a juridical person where you have most of the board meetings in the UAE, all the directors, all the decisions are taking place in the UAE. So it's going to be considered that this juridical person is in the end effectively managed and controlled in the UAE. Therefore, it's going to be considered subject to tax in the UAE. And so first, yeah, we're going to look in general at the facts and circumstances and the strategic management and commercial decisions. And it's important to note that not only the um, entities that are established and effectively managed in the UAE, they're subject to tax, but as well as it was in the case of natural persons, we are also going to tax non-resident in certain scenarios. So the first, first scenario, it's going to be whether we deem that a permanent establishment was created in the UAE. So a permanent establishment, it's a juridical fiction, so we are going to consider if a non-UAE established company are taking core business activities and there is a certain degree of permanence. In general, we're going to consider over a period of six months. We are going to consider that was created a fixed place of business in the UAE. Therefore, this company will be subject to tax in the UAE. And it's important to note that this can also happen in the case of a dependent agent. So if the juridical person has an agent here based in the UAE that is concluding contracts, negotiating contracts, concluding decisions, it's going to be considered that this legal entity, regardless whether it's established or not in the UAE, has a dependent agent based in the UAE. Therefore, it's going to be subject to taxes. And a different scenario where non-resident persons are subject to tax in the UAE, it's in the case there is a nexus. So the nexus, it's also a concept where we consider there's a link with the UAE. So in the case of juridical persons, this is going to be in the case of a juridical person has immovable property in the UAE. So in the case they have a factory, they have a another property or a building where they are rental or they are promoting activities, this will be considered as a nexus in the UAE. Uh, here on the corporate tax uh, rates, uh, no news and the way the law was structured was that the same uh, corporate tax applies to both natural persons and juridical persons. So here, similar to uh, what Zubir has explained, uh, the corporate tax law has a first threshold of up to 375,000 dirhams that is subject to zero. So in the end, if the taxable income after the calculation of the accounting, it's going to reach only until 375,000 dirhams, then it will be subject to zero percent, therefore uh, no corporate tax due. But all the other taxable income exceeding 375,000 dirhams will be then subject to 9%. And similar uh, in the case of non-resident persons, uh, the same uh, rates apply. The only difference is that uh, for juridical persons uh, established or effectively managed and controlled in the UAE, the corporate tax will apply to the worldwide income. So we are considering income both from abroad and from the activities in the UAE. Uh, whereas in the cases of non-residents, in the case of permanent establishment, or in the case of a nexus because of a property in the UAE, we are only considering the income related to the permanent establishment or to the nexus. Uh, here, uh, with respect to the tax period, uh, I just would like to highlight a difference we mentioned before. So for individuals, we always consider the Gregorian uh, calendar year, so January to December, whereas for juridical persons, we can have different scenarios because we are based on the financial years that uh, aligns with the financial accounts, the financial statements. And we can have companies that are preparing their financial statements in a year from 1st of June to 31st of May. And for this first scenario, we, we might have a few companies 
that started their uh, first uh, CT period in 1st of June 2023. So they are almost coming to the end of the first tax period, uh, now in 31st of May. And then they will have nine months to prepare their accounting documents and to prepare the return and filing for the tax period. So the first um, city returns we are expecting, they're going to be filed by end of February 2025. But we believe that most of the companies, uh, they are filing following the calendar year. So the first uh, year started uh, 1st of January of 2024 going all the way until 31st of December, and then again, they will have nine months to file the tax return. Ideally, they, they will file a bit before, and then we are expecting to receive the returns of majority of companies up to 30 of September 2025. And then we can also have uh, for new companies that are, were established this year, or they have, uh, they have chosen to start their financial year 1st of April 2024, going all the way until 31st of March 2025. And again, they will have a uh, nine months to file the tax return. And we are expecting to receive those returns by 31st December 2025. And uh, important point to stress that we, we mentioned that uh, in the context of uh, corporate tax registrations for individual, in the case of juridical persons, we don't have that exclusion. So even if, uh, let's say, companies established in the UAE, they were not being active or they had very little turnover during a certain year, they still need to register for corporate tax purposes and they have to file a return. Even though there might be the case, some of the returns will be considered new because there is no amount to be taxed, but they have to meet this compliance requirement and they need to file tax returns. Uh, here, I'm, I mentioned briefly before, but once again, it's important to stress that for resident persons, we are always considered the worldwide income. So it's the taxable income derived from the UA transactions, from the UA properties, as well as from uh, transactions and properties and assets located outside the UAE. Whereas in the case of non-resident persons, since this is kind of a um, they are in, um, being taxed not uh, as the first rule. They are just being taxed on the income attributed to the permanent establishment in the UAE. So for that specific set of transactions or set of activities in the UAE, or in the case of a uh, income from a uh, immovable property located in the UAE. So we are focused on that nexus uh, created by that immovable property, and we are only taxing the amount related to that property. And about the real estate income, when Zubir presented the real estate income in relation to individuals, we understand that there is that exception and we are only considering when the turnover is above 1 million zihans. Whereas in the case of juridical persons, we don't have this exception, we don't have this threshold. So any real estate income derived by a juridical person will be subject to tax. And the idea is that here we are talking about a capital gain from the disposal of the immovable property, or in the case of rental, in the case of real estate management activities, or any other income related to the real estate properties located in the UAE. And here, uh, we just want to provide you this list of uh, the most common real estate uh, activities in the UAE. Uh, the list is not exhaustive, but just to give you some guidance on what we consider as real estate activities. We have property development, property rental, regardless of the use, if it's residential or commercial, brokerage firms for expatriate housing, retail space, uh, off-plan property sales, real estate marketing and advisory firms. So it's important to state even those activities, they are not really related to the rental, but they are related to marketing, advisory, and any related activities to real estate, they will be considered as real estate activities. And just to make it clear, I would like to provide with some 
examples. Uh, in the first scenario, we have the case of a real estate developer. A ABC company is incorporated in the UAE, so they are subject to tax in that first rule. They are incorporated in the UAE. They are straight considered as a resident person. And this company is engaged in real estate development. A ABC company uses the IFRS standards and their financial year is from 1st of September to 31st of August. They have registered for corporate tax purposes and during the first tax period uh, that is ending 31st uh, August 2024, the company reached a revenue of 240 million dirhams from real estate projects. And all the costs related to these activities were up to 208 uh, million dirhams. So the real estate developer, they will calculate the taxable income based on the rules provided in Article 20 of the city law. They will make uh, adjustments uh, reaching 2,000 million dirhams in respect of non-deductible expenditure. So the way we're going to calculate the taxable income in this example, we're going to first uh, consider the accounting income, which is the revenue from the real estate activity, 2,040 million, less the cost, 2,008 million. And then we're going to make the related tax adjustment of 2,000 million dirhams, reaching out a taxable income of 34 million dirhams. Then the way we're going to calculate the corporate tax due is that the first step, we're going to consider up to 375 subject to zero. And then we're going to calculate that uh, we have the 34 uh, subject to tax, less than 375,000 dirhams. Uh, and we're going to apply 9% rate and reaching uh, 3.2006 uh, uh, million dirhams, 250. Uh, the second example, uh, I want to um, draw attention to the case of a non-resident person. So this non-resident person, it's a real estate investment company based in the UK, but they decided to take advantage of the real estate market in the UAE, and they decided to have specific projects here in the UAE. So in order to operate in the UAE, they open up a branch office to, to handle the projects here in the UAE. And when they open up this branch and they're uh, developing activities in the UAE, they constituted a permanent establishment. So this permanent establishment engages in real estate activities uh, such as property acquisition, property development, leasing, sales, so all sorts of uh, real estate transactions. But they also keep doing advisory and consultant services for other projects outside the UAE that are not related to the activities developed by the branch. So in this case, uh, if you remember, uh, the permanent establishment, it's only text uh, in relation to the activities developed in the UAE. So when we are going to calculate the, the revenue for the purpose of calculating the, the corporate tax due, we are only considering the revenue derived from the permanent establishment. So we are excluding any advisory consultant service related to the UK or any other countries where they are operating. And here I have another example, in this case again a non-resident, but uh, the way they're linked to the corporate tax law, it's because of a nexus in the UAE. So in this case we have a company N that is incorporated and effectively managed in a different country, country N. And this company is engaged in industrial research, but then they really also want to make use of uh, the real estate uh, growing in the UAE, so they decided to buy land in the UAE as an investment. Uh, in this case, uh, they decided to lease to an unrelated company the land they held in the UAE. And in the following year, uh, in 2025, they are going to be able to sell the land uh, to make a profit and then in these cases, they didn't constitute a PE. And in the 2025, in the next year, by the time of the sale of this land, they're also going to be considered to have a nexus. And in this case, uh, the nexus will be triggered by the sale of the land. So the profit will have to be realized and they will be subject to tax. 
So in this case, uh, the company is subject to corporate tax law uh, both in 2024 and 2025. In 2024, we are going to consider the profit related to the rental of the land. And in the following year, the calculation will be based on the profit made on the sale. So now I'll pass to Rita and he'll guide you through the transitional rules with respect to removable properties. Thank you. Thanks very much, Juliana. Uh, so I'll talk to you about the uh, transitional uh, rules under the corporate tax law. And I think transitional rules, the purpose of them is to uh, establish and consolidate fairness. Of course, you know that uh, most of the taxable person or many taxable person will be in a situation where they acquired assets before the city, uh, the first, their first city period. And uh, of course, they may transfer or dispose of these assets, uh, you know, during the first city period or after the first city period. And the purpose of the transition rule is to immune the capital gains uh, from the uh, corporate tax as far as those capital gains they are related to a period before the first city period. So this is the policy intention and this is the aim of the uh, transitional rules and the transitional rules have been reflected under uh, Ministerial Decision 120 of uh, 2023. So basically the um, transition rule, they allow you to um, elect for uh, a specific methods and you can choose the method that you will apply and these rules the transition rule they apply to gains on immovable property so on uh, real estate properties also they will apply to gains on tangible intangible assets or also gains and losses on financial other financial uh, assets and financial liability for the sake of applying the uh, transition rule I think it is ex extremely important to look at Article 61, Clause 1 of the city law. And Article uh, uh, 61, Clause 1 refer to the fact that the closing balance sheet on the last day of the financial year, immediately preceding the tax period, is the opening balance sheet of a tax taxable person, first tax period. What is the first tax period for a taxable person? Of course, this has been uh, clarified by the first, uh, you know, uh, by the city law. And we, in, in one of the first slides, you know, of our first slides today, we talked about the first city period. So for a, a taxable person with a financial year ending on 31st December, the first city period will be uh, 1st January 2024 till 31st December 2024. For a taxable person with a financial year ending on 31st of May, it's going to be from 1st of June 2023 to 31st of May 2024. For a taxable person with a financial year end on the uh, you know, uh, 30 April, the first tax period will be from 1st of May 2024 till 30 April 2025. If we look at the condition to apply the transitional rules, so the, um, the adjustment for the taxable income and the exclusion of the capital gains on immovable properties, uh, you know, that pertains to a period before the first city period, the condition are basically that is that the immovable property is owned prior to the first city period. This is why it is very important to determine what is your first uh, tax period for city purposes. The, uh, you know, the uh, immovable property should be valued and measured at a historical cost. And also the immovable property should be disposed of or deemed to be disposed of uh, for a value exceeding the net book value. Because for the purpose of the transitional rules, we are not considering losses, we are only immuning capital uh, gains. Then, of course, in order to apply these rules, you need to elect for this. And the election will happen when you file your first corporate tax return. At the time of filing your first corporate tax return on the uh, Imara tax, you will be able to make this election. 
and choose one of the uh, methods that I will uh, explain in the following slides. And of course, the election is irrevocable unless uh, there will be some exceptional uh, circumstances uh, approved by the uh, federal uh, tax authority. So the first method for the computation of the gain that will be excluded for uh, city purposes and that pertains to the uh, a period before the first city period. So basically the gain will be, that will be excluded is the amount of the uh, capital gain that would have arisen had the qualifying immovable property been disposed of uh, at market value at the start of the first tax period. So we will deem, we will assume that you sold your immovable property on the first day, you know, of the first uh, uh, CT period, and we will uh, take that gain and we will exclude it from the corporate tax base. And of course, in that case, the gain will be uh, considered based on a cost which is the higher of the original cost or the net book value uh, at the time of the uh, deemed disposal for this, uh, you know, immovable property or qualifying immovable property. The market value for this, uh, you know, uh, method or this first method is basically uh, the market value as determined by the relevant competent authority for the valuation of immovable property in Dubai is going to be RIRA, in Abu Dhabi, for example, is going to be Department of Municipal uh, Affairs. The second method is a slightly different, so the second method will look, will rely on the ownership. So we'll, uh, we will look at the uh, percentage determined based on the uh, ownership period you know, uh, uh, up to the disposal of the, uh, you know, uh, assets or the ownership uh, period, you know, uh, before the first city period, based on the, uh, or a pro data from the overall ownership period, from the date of the acquisition of the qualifying immovable property up to the date of the deemed uh, disposal. So if we, uh, look at an example, and of course this method, it is the taxable person is free to elect one of these methods, and as we can see, they can, they can give, like, uh, trigger different, uh, different outcomes. Again, we, I think it's very important to assess whether your immovable property is a qualifying immovable property, so we uh, repeat the condition, so you should own it prior to your first uh, uh, tax uh, period for corporate tax purposes. So if your tax period start is going from 1st of January 2024 to the 31st of December 2024, if you acquired the move property on the 2nd January 2024 or after that, it will not be considered as a qualifying immovable property. And then the second condition is that the uh, qualifying uh, immovable property should be valued at, you know, historical costs at the level of your financial statement and then the third condition is that it should be uh, disposed of or deemed to be disposed of during or after the first city period. Now, let's look at the, uh, an example on the computation. So assuming uh, that company H purchased an immovable property on 1st of January 2021 for the value of three million dirhams at an arm's length price. And there is an annual depreciation of uh, 100. 100,000 uh, based on IFRS or uh, IFRS for SMEs uh, depending on the position of the taxable person. If on 1st of January 2024, the opening balance sheets records the move property at a net book value of 2.7 million, so 3 million minus the accumulated depreciation. If the company would sell the property on 31st December 2024, assuming for 4.2 million, and then recognize uh, a gain in its financial statement of 1.5 million. This company would have the choice between, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, two uh, methods. So if, comp if the company will apply the, uh, the first uh, uh, method so basically, company H will 
uh, of course, have a first tax period going from 1st of January 31st December 2024. If we assume that the market value on the 1st of January 2024, so the first day of the first CT period is 3.7, uh, based on RIRA value, if the movable property is located in uh, RIRA, we will determine the amount of the capital gain that will be excluded based on each of the methods that we uh, determined, that we saw in the previous slide. So for the first method, the step one is to look at the market value at the start of the first tax period. And the market value, as we said, is 3.7 million. Step two is to identify the higher of the original cost and the net book value. And in that case, the higher will be the uh, original cost. So we take the three million. What would be the excluded gain or capital gain uh, amount in that case? So basically it will be the market value at the start of the first CT period minus the higher of the original cost or the uh, net book value and then it will be 3.7 million minus 3 million. And then the 700,000, uh, you know, difference will be the gain excluded for corporate tax purposes. So this gain will not be subject to corporate tax. And then we will, uh, of course, offset this gain from the, uh, for the sake of determining the taxable income and only 800,000 will be included in the taxable income will be subject to uh, CT. This is based on the first method. The second method looks at the uh, percentage based on the ownership period. So for, this, uh, first, uh, for the second method, step one is to compute the amount of the gain that would have arisen upon the disposal of the removal property had its cost been equal to the higher of the original cost and the net book value at the start date of the first tax period. And then in that case, the gain will be 4.2 minus 3 million. So basically it will be 1.2 million. And then we will look at the percentage base, we will determine the percentage based on the period of ownership. So we will divide the number of days the removal properties owned before the first city period by the overall number of days. So from the date of the acquisition, of the property until the day of the disposal or the deemed disposal. And based on these dates, we will have a percentage approximately of 0 0.75. So we will have 1,095 days by 1,461 days, which gives uh, 0 0.75 uh, uh, approximately. And then step three, we will calculate the uh, excluded gain and based on that percentage. So we have an overall gain, capital gains of 1.2 million. Then the excluded gain will be uh, 1.2 by 75% or by 0 0.75 and then it will be 900,000. So basically we will exclude 900,000 and then only 600,000 will be included in the taxable income. Again, the corporate tax law and ministerial decision 120 for the transitional rules is there for the sake of fairness. If you bought the movable property, for example, in 2020, during the COVID, of course, the value was low. It is unfair that now if the movable property, the value went up as a taxable person, you will pay uh, uh, capital gains on the overall amounts. And then again, for the sake of the flexibility of the corporate tax law, uh, it allows you to choose and between two methods. Okay. Then I think we can go to the next uh, part that is related to realization basis and the uh, depreciation with my colleague Juliana. Hello again everyone. So now it's a quick point, but an important one in the context of real estate. Uh, we are going to talk about the realization basis 
the, that is an election under corporate tax law, and also the depreciation rules. Uh, here uh, we are talking about when calculating taxable gains and losses. Uh, when we have a taxable person uh, making use of the accrual base of accounting, so mostly of the juridical persons, probably they, they will take uh, in consideration the accrual basis because the other option is cash base of accounting, but then there is a limit of 3 million dirhams. But uh, for most of the cases, when taking into consideration accrual basis, uh, the juridical person will consider any unrealized gain or losses in respect of the movable properties, and they are going to take into account in determination of the taxable income by the time it was recognized in the financial statements. So in this first scenario, uh, as soon as you would recognize in the financial statements, even though the transaction might not have happened yet, then you are going to consider already if there was a gain or a loss. But um, the corporate tax law uh, provides for this election, that is some sort of relief, that you are only going to take into consideration the accounts gains and losses when it happens uh, the realization. So we are going to call this the realization basis. And in this case, if you have any unrealized gains or losses, let's say uh, the revaluation or any change in the book value, these will be disregarded when you are calculating the taxable income and you're only going to take into consideration by the time the immovable property is disposed. So we are going to wait and for the realization at uh, when the event actually happens. Uh, so here, just to distinguish the two different concepts, when we are talking about realized gain and losses, we are talking about the actual gains when it occurs to the completion of the transaction. So when you have the actual, let's say, the actual sale of the property. And when we are talking about unrealized gains or losses, we are talking about the change in the value or the liability. So without the actual disposal or the transfer. And in the case of the election, the taxable person follow the accrual basis. So once again, this cannot be elected in the case of a cash base of accounting. This election will allow the taxable person to calculate the taxable income, either in relation to all assets or liabilities or only the ones related to capital by the time of realization. And this is an election to be paid at the first tax period. So this cannot be changed. So if by the time of the first tax return, you make this election to consider these transactions on a realization basis, this will be considered from now onwards. You cannot change this election. And here, some more details uh, with respect to the depreciation rules. Uh, once again, with relation to the accounting standards, you can only make the election for depreciation in the case of accrual base of accountings and follow the IFRS uh, for the calculation of financial statements or IFRS for small and medium enterprises. That these are the, the two standards acceptable for the calculation of accrual basis. And here, uh, they are considered as deductible according to the general rules, and there is no separate uh, tax depreciation rates. So when we're calculating the accrual basis, we are calculating under the general rules of deductibility. And as I mentioned, uh, with respect to the cash base of accounting, for uh, in the case of uh, revenue below 3 million dirhams, there is no relief for depreciation available. However, uh, in these cases, a deduction can be taken into account for the assets purchases when would you ordinarily do the depreciation. Uh, with respect to other cases than the realization, let's say in the case of depreciation of the asset, amortization, or other change in the value of the immovable properties, there are, this could be considered as excluded from the account income when you are calculating the not only when you make the election for the realization, but in the case of depreciation, amortization, and other changes, the election will be also taken into consideration. 
And now my colleague Zubir will talk about the small business relief that can also be applicable to the uh, income related to real estate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juliana. So, small business relief. We've left this, this to slightly later in the presentation because it's, because it's applicable to both natural persons and juridical persons. So, what is small business relief and why do we have it? Small business relief is found in Article 21 of the Corporate Tax Law and Ministerial Decision 73 of 2023. And as I just mentioned, it applies both to natural persons and to juridical persons, so the smaller, the smaller businesses. And it's intended to ease the transition into the corporate tax regime. We appreciate the introduction of the corporate tax regime is a big change, and that's why small, relief, small business relief is in the corporate tax law. And if you are eligible, if you do elect for small business relief, then you're treated as if you have not had any taxable income in that tax period. And it's important to note for each single tax period, an election has to be made if you wish to claim for small business relief. So what are the benefits? There's an administrative relief and a tax relief. In terms of the administrative relief, you are not obligated to calculate your taxable income and there is a simplified tax return. In terms of a tax relief, if you are eligible for small business relief, then there is no corporate tax to pay. Now, this isn't specifically in relation to, to real estate income, but it will apply. If someone otherwise would have income that's subject to tax and they are under the threshold, then they can elect for small business relief and have that income as not being considered as taxable because of small business relief. So what are the conditions and who can elect? The most important is revenue, and I will come on to that in just a moment. But as I mentioned, it's for juridical and natural persons who are resident in the UAE. So I mentioned before, for natural persons, if you're conducting business or business activity in the UAE, you are considered resident and you will be eligible to apply for small business relief. And as mentioned by Juliana recently, juridical persons who are resident in the UAE, either by incorporation or effectively managed and controlled, are resident persons and they will be eligible for small business relief. There are instances for free zone persons and not qualifying free zone persons. So if someone is a free zone person, that doesn't prohibit them from being in this regime to, uh, to be eligible for, for small business relief, but they cannot be a qualifying free zone person in the free zone regime. If they've opted out under Article 19 of the Corporate Tax Law, then they will fall into the category which can uh, be eligible for small business relief. Now, importantly, what are the conditions? And I'm about to turn towards revenue, and I, I appreciate that earlier on in this session, we mentioned turnover, we mentioned taxable income. So we need to shift our mindset slightly. And I will go on to on the next slide about how you reach revenue. But for turnover, that was separate. That's for natural persons, and that is in consideration of the 1 million dirham threshold under Cabinet Decision 49. And for those purposes, as you'll recall, there's those three categories of exclusions. And revenue is a separate concept completely. And like I mentioned, we'll go to that in just a moment. But for now, the most important condition for small business relief is the threshold of three million dirhams of revenue. And that is both in the current tax period and the previous tax periods. So small business relief, is under Ministerial Decision 73, Article 2. It's eligible for periods from the 1st of June, 2023, up till the 31st of December, 2026. So any tax periods which start on, on, on or, or uh, on the 1st of June, or end on or before the 31st of December, 2026, those tax periods 
are going to be eligible for small business relief. And it has to be 3 million derived in the current and previous tax periods. Now, I appreciate I mentioned before, for natural persons, there can only be a tax period of the Gregorian calendar year. Now, Christine and Juliana explained that for juridical persons, there are instances where they may have a shorter or a longer tax period. If that is the case, the threshold does not change. It's not increased, it's not decreased, subject to the length of the tax period. That threshold is fixed at 3 million dirhams. So who cannot elect? I just mentioned uh, qualifying free zone persons, so they will be outside of the, of the regime. Uh, if the entity, so not a natural person, for a juridical person, if they are a member of a multinational group, and that is also specified in Ministerial Decision 73, if they have consolidated group revenue of more than 3.15 billion in revenue, then they won't be eligible for small business relief, having been part of that uh, multinational group. And secondly, there's an anti-fragmentation rule. So if an entity tries to separate its activity into a number of businesses, to fall under that three million dirham threshold, they won't be eligible for small business relief. That is not the intended use or application of small business relief, and so they will not qualify for the relief. So revenue, how do we derive it? What's it based on? Well, revenue is the gross amount of income derived during a tax period, and it's calculated based on the applicable accounting standards that can be both IFRS or IFRS for SMEs. And the revenue, as I mentioned, has to be three million or lower. And you, you'll recall from just a moment ago, Juliana said there's also, as well as the accruals basis, there's the cash basis of accounting. And the threshold for that is also three million. So for small business relief, when you are calculating your threshold, whether you're eligible for the relief or not, you can use both the accruals or the cash basis to determine your revenue. It can be used for either, whichever you draw your accounts with can be used to calculate your revenue. Now, transfer for pricing documentation is not required, but when you are calculating the revenue, it must be determined on an arm's length basis. So that will be in line with Article 34 and 35 of the Corporate Tax Law. If there are any interactions with related parties, then those transactions need to be at an arm's length basis. So if something is, is charged under with a related party and your revenue might fall below the 3 million dirham threshold, if that is a related party and there is an adjustment and that pushes your, your revenue over the three million, you will not be eligible for small business relief. So what does revenue include? It is, the starting point, sale of goods and services. They will be included in your calculation of revenue. But it can also include sale of your business assets. So if you have capital disposals, if you sell property, that will also be included. Any disposals will contribute towards your calculation of your revenue. It's not simply your, your, your revenue that you're, you're realizing from renting. It can also be capital disposals. If you have exempt income, so if you're receiving dividends from a juridical person that's resident, that's exempted by Article 22 of the CT law, that will also be included as part of your revenue calculation. And non-cash receipts. We appreciate maybe there's an exchange of assets, maybe there's an exchange of property or real estate is provided as part of a transaction. Now the market value of that transaction will be included in your revenue. Revenue does not include two points. So the first is VAT charged by businesses, as that will be remitted to the Federal Tax Authority, so that is not included in your revenue calculation. And secondly, loans or advances received. So if you are um, 
if you're borrowing money, especially in terms of in real estate to purchase something, that is not considered as part of your revenue. So I'm going to walk through a couple of examples just to highlight the points that I've, I've just mentioned. And the first is a calculation of revenue. And I mentioned revenue is the pinnacle point of small business relief. It's not taxable income, it's not turnover, it's revenue. Not profits, the focus will always be on revenue for small business relief. So here we have company A, which is a UAE resident company. And as I mentioned, they have to be a resident person to elect for small business relief. In its most recent tax period, it has revenue of 2.5 million dirhams. And it's also got 300,000 dividends. So just mentioned, dividends is included in the calculation of revenue, even if it's exempted by Article 22 of the CT law. We're also told in this example that there's operating expenses of 2 million dirhams. So the total revenue with the 2.5 and the 0 0.3 million dirhams will be a total of 2.8 million dirhams, which is fine. It's under the threshold of 3 million dirhams. As I mentioned, the operating expenditure, the costs of 2 million dirhams mean there's a net profit of 0 0.8 million dirhams. But this isn't relevant. We're not concerned with the profit. We are simply concerned that the revenue is under 3 million dirhams. And in this case, it is. As such, this company, Company A, a UAE resident company, has under 3 million dirhams and they will be eligible. So their real estate activity, being under the threshold, will be eligible for small business relief. So they'll have the simplified tax return. They won't be required to calculate their taxable income and they will have no corporate tax to pay. Now this next example is going to highlight the principle about previous tax periods. So in this example, we've got a natural person, Mr. White, and they are a sole establishment licensed. So as we discussed uh, earlier this morning, license subject to tax included as part of the turnover, it will not be excluded from their calculation of turnover or taxable income. They're a resident person, so they could be eligible for small business relief. And their tax period, again, bringing together another point, will be up till 31st of December and the calendar year in each year. So in the tax period ending on the 31st of December 2026, so a couple of years in the future, their revenue is 1.9 million dirhams. So it's lower than the 3 million dirham threshold. However, in the previous year, in the year ending the 31st of December 2025, they had a revenue from their business of 4.3 million dirhams. And because of that previous tax period, they can no longer apply for small business relief. Not in the year ending 31st of December 2025, but also the year ending 31st of December 2026. They will not be eligible for small business relief on, on their income. That brings me to the end of small business relief. It's a very useful relief for smaller taxpayers, smaller businesses, and there is an interaction with real estate. So if people are holding smaller portfolios, this may be a relief which is suited to them. Thank you very much. I'll pass over to Christine. Thank you very much, Subir. Okay, so I'm actually just gonna go now through the final part of the presentation and hopefully just bring together some of the concepts and things that people have sort of mentioned throughout the um, presentation. So this is really for the accountants in the room or anyone who has to actually respond and say, hey, this is what our, our position is um, in relation to our real estate, the income that we're earning, what we have to produce at the end of the year when we're filing our tax return. So the key thing is the accounting standards, so your starting point. I'll go through the registration requirements again, as well as deregistration if that's um, applicable. Um, the tax returns, um, payment of the tax, because that's sort of why we're here. Any documentation requirements, as well as penalties and violations. So one of the things that we have mentioned throughout this presentation is um, taxable income. So the starting point for calculating your taxable income is going to be your accounting net profit and loss. So we've tried to make it as simple as possible 
You start off with your accounting net profit and loss, and that has to be calculated based on the applicable accounting standards. So we've mentioned a couple of times, for UAE corporate tax purposes, the accepted accounting standard is going to be the international financial reporting standards. If you make a revenue of less than 50 million, you can use the IFRS standards for small and medium-sized enterprises. But it is going to be the, the IFRS standards. If you are a non-resident or you're, you've got a parent company that's a non-resident, um, you use, for instance, another different uh, accounting standard, say GAAP, you will have to make sure that you follow, for any of your tax obligations in the UAE, you follow um, IFRS or IFRS for SMEs. Now, you will be required to prepare financial statements as part of preparing um, uh, for your, your accounting net profit and loss. You have to prepare financial statements and those need to be prepared based on the accruals basis. So that's the, the, the default position when it comes to preparing your financial statements. We have mentioned a couple of times that there is the option of using the cash basis. So that makes things a little bit simpler for the smaller businesses. And that's available to any of the businesses, so natural persons or juridical persons, if they generate revenue, um, as Zubair has just um, explained, of less than 3 million dirhams. If you are facing exceptional circumstances, you also can apply to the FTA to use the cash basis. But generally the default position is the accruals basis for accounting. Um, there is the option, if you are small, to use uh, the cash basis of accounting. You also have elections that um, uh, Juliana went through and uh, Rita to use the realisation basis as well for accounting for any gains or losses that you make on the property. So just from an accounting perspective and preparing for the first tax period, it's really important to understand the, the uh, accounting standards that apply to you, any of the elections that you want to make, as well as the transitional rules and the impact for you on, um, on your accounting and profit and loss. Okay, I think we've mentioned a couple of times now, so I'll just quickly go over it. Registration. Um, so registration is available on the Amara Tax portal. Um, hands up who's got an Amara Tax account um, already set up. So one of the things that I do want to highlight, and that's fantastic, is when you go and create an account, you're creating um, an account, but you also then have to set up a taxable person account. So say, for instance, you're responsible for multiple businesses. Each one of those businesses, you don't need to set up separate login um, accounts for Amara Tax. What you need to do is set up different taxable person profiles in Amara Tax. So it's really important that you understand which profile you're operating under um, and submit your registration through that taxable person uh, profile. Now, if you do need to deregister, um, that is also done through Amara Tax, and you have to deregister uh, within three months of seizing your business. So if you're a natural person, say for instance, uh, you're a natural person and you're non-resident because you have a nexus, um, sorry, a permanent establishment in the UAE, and say you sold that business and you have no other connection to the UAE, it's going to be three months from when you sold, sorry, that property. Now, deregistration will only be effective once you've filed all your final tax returns and you've also paid any outstanding instalments. A very key aspect of the whole regime is your tax return. So it's really important that you're ready to submit your tax return. The de deadline for tax return submission is nine months from the end of the tax period. So whatever tax period you have, you have nine months to prepare all the accounting records and statements, collect all the documentation that you need to, to support your tax position, and file your tax return. Now the tax return is also going to be filed um, on Amara Tax as well. So Amara Tax is pretty much your one stop for all your obl obligations and compliance requirements uh, in relation to corporate tax, excise tax, VAT, and any other interactions that you have with the FTA. We will have the option of a tax return via Amara Tax, and once you go into the tax return for the relevant tax period, certain information will be defaulted for you, but then there's the things that we've discussed in this presentation that you will have the option to make elections for in your tax return. So for instance, if you're claiming the small business relief, that election will be made in the tax return. Um, if you're choosing to use the realisation basis um, to account for your net profit and loss, that election will also be made in tax return. Um, and you'll also be reporting, I guess, the outcome of your, your tax year. Now, one of the things that we want to mention here is that we do operate in um, United Arab Emirates dirhams. So all your transactions need to be accounted and reported for in dirhams. 
if you for some reason are using a foreign currency to transact in, what we're asking is that you need to use um, the spot rate as published by the Central Bank of the UAE. And the spot rate has to apply to each transaction. If that the spot rate is unreasonable um, or impractical for you to use a spot rate per transaction, then the next option is that you use the average monthly exchange rate as published by the Central Bank again. And then if that is an unreasonable or impractical um, rate to use, then you can use the average annual exchange rate. But it's really important that you make sure that, that you go through the options because you have to justify why you're using the different rates. Now, most of you guys, if you're already registered for, Z, uh, for VAT or excise tax, you're already aware of the tax procedures law and your documentation requirements under the TPL. There's not much different for that. The key thing here, though, is that you do need to prepare financial statements and they have to be maintained for all business and business activities. So both juridical persons and natural persons need to maintain financial statements. If you don't have an annual um, revenue that exceeds three million, you can use the cash basis, as we mentioned before. If your annual revenue does exceed 50 million dirhams though, your financial statements will need to be audited. And finally, the FCA can request that information, your financial statements at any time really will give you notice, but most likely it'll be part of the obligations when you're submitting your tax return to also file your financial statements as well. Another thing that we've mentioned today is, your trans is transfer pricing. So for real estate transactions, most of the time, unless you are um, transacting with a related party or connected person, your price is your price and that's market value. If you are transacting with a related party or connected person, you need to maintain documentation to support the valuation that you've given, the market value of that transaction. If, for instance, you are a natural person and you've set up an LLC, um, that you're the sole owner of that LLC and they're the ones who are managing your property, any transactions between the natural person and the LLC needs to be at market value and you need to maintain documentation for that. Again, that documentation can be re requested by the FTA and you'll be given 30 days. So it's, it's very good practice to make sure that you're maintaining that throughout the year, throughout your tax period. Also under the TPL is your record keeping requirements. So at the moment, it's five years for, all your, um, for VAT and excise tax. However, under the corporate tax law, we're requesting that you maintain your, um, all this documentation for seven years. So you need to maintain all your records your tax returns that you filed, supporting documentation that you're using and relying on, your financial statements, all of that for seven years after the end of the tax period. Now, similar to VAT, um, the same deadline for filing your tax return applies to the payments. So for corporate tax, you have nine months to file your tax return. You also have nine months to pay any corporate tax liability that you have. For refunds, we don't see that there's going to be very many of those, um, given the fact that we have a 0% withholding tax. Um, but if there is a mistake made, you can also apply for a refund through um, a Maritax portal as well. Now penalties. Uh, one of the things that we really want to stress at the FTA is that we don't want this to be burdensome on taxpayers and we want to be as clear as possible and, and as helpful as possible to, the F um, to taxpayers. So it's really important that you're aware of all the information that's available to you and that you're aware of your compliance obligations. So there's specific penalties that apply for corporate tax um, and that was issued in uh, a decision. Uh, here's just a brief summary of those penalties as well as the other penalties that apply under the tax procedures law. But the key things here is be aware of your compliance obligations. So file your registration application, um, maintain documentation, submit your tax return on time, make your tax payment if uh, applicable on time, make sure that your tax return is as accurate as possible. Um, so voluntary di um, disclosures are applicable as well, but it's really good practice just to make sure that you're ensuring everything is documented and correct as you go along. Okay, now, this is one of the things we've received a lot of questions for you during the break. Um, we've received a lot of questions before the session, um, but this is uh, another avenue that the FTA wants to be able to help taxpayers. 
So we offer um, tax, uh, corporate tax clarifications, so private clarifications, and the key word here is that they're private clarifications. So we don't publish these clarifications because private clarifications are very specific to the taxpayer's circumstance or the applicant's circumstances. So clarifications are available again through the Amara Tax Portal, and the purpose of a clarification is to um, uh, clarify an area of uncertainty that applies to you as a, an applicant. So it has to relate only to you and your tax affairs and it has to be in relation to an area of uncertainty. So Rita mentioned before that we've been issuing a lot of guides and there are more guides to come. Um, I know there's a lot of questions about free zones, so there is a free zone guide coming. Um, but if you are still uncertain about any of the positions and you've read the guides, you've read the law, um, perhaps maybe you've consulted with an advisor, if you are still uncertain, please uh, submit a tax clarification. The FDA has 50 days to respond. Um, but what we do want to make sure is that when you do submit a clarification request, uh, that it's a valid request. So you submit that through Amara Tax. We really need everyone to make sure that they submit all the supporting documentation in relation to their query and that they clearly set out the background facts um, as well as clearly articulate the questions that they're asking for a response on. As part of that application, you also have to do your own assessment of the tax position. Um, so it's not a process of just getting tax advice from the FTA. It's really important that you submit your position and what you think is the, the correct technical position after you've done your analysis of the f specific facts. So I'll give you an example, for instance. If you're a natural person and you want to know, for instance, is uh, I own this building, um, uh, I'm renting it out, uh, what, what is the tax implications of that? What you'll need to do is analyse the law, analyse any of the guides, um, uh, attend this presentation, uh, and then uh, tell us if there's anything that's uncertain. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions, for instance, about the interactions between a natural person and a sole establishment. So hopefully we have uh, um, helped you guys understand the difference between those um, versus, for instance, uh, a natural person who's set up an, a single uh, owner LLC and the interaction between those different sort of, uh, I guess, players um, or arrangements and the tax implications for those. Um, so those are some of the common questions that we're getting in relation to real estate. But make sure that you put your analysis of the technical position as well as provide any supporting documentation. And it has to relate to your specific circumstances. So the only people that can apply for a, a clarification are people, uh, is the applicant in relation to their own specific circumstances or a legal representative or a tax agent. Um, but you can't ask for advice on behalf of someone else unless you are authorised to do so. Now we have 50 days and we might come back to you for further information, which is why it's really helpful to make sure that you include all that information in the submission itself. Um, on that note, I want to thank you all for attending. I wanted to, hopefully we've given you enough information in terms of the specific aspects in relation to real estate in, um, and income and the interactions of the corporate tax law as well as other requirements around that. Um, but if you have any questions, please let us know. And I'll pass on. Thank you, Ruda. Thank you so much to our expert for uh, this uh, valuable presentation. Moving to another important uh, part of our agenda today, our Q&A session. Upon registration of this workshop, many of you have submitted their questions and our expert tax policy team today will lead the conversation. Join me pl please again in welcoming them to provide answers to your questions. So let's start with the first question to uh, Juliana. In which cases is a natural person's income from real estate subject to UAE corporate tax? Thank you for this question, Ruda. Uh, in the case of um, natural persons, uh, we saw that we consider a turnover of 1 million dirhams to consider uh, whether they are subject to corporate tax or not. But then, real estate uh, income investment your, your mic may be... Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So real estate uh, investment, real estate investment income is 
You can't hear? Uh, okay, sorry. Hear. Please, the voice. Can you hear me now? Just a minute. He passed the mic. Sorry for. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yeah, so yeah, it works better now. Yeah, so in the case of natural persons, first we have to analyze whether their turnover was over 1 million dirhams then they would be considered as a taxable person. But as we saw, real estate investment come is excluded from the calculation of this turnover unless the natural person is required to have a license or has a license to conduct its real estate uh, business. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, moving to the next question, uh, Christine. Does the size of a natural person's real estate portfolio matter for UAE corporate tax purposes? Uh, no. So whether you have one property, a hundred properties, uh, a whole building, um, multiple uh, portfolios of, of property and land, the key consideration when it comes to whether or not the real estate that you own is subject to corporate tax is whether or not you have a license in relation to operating um, or earning income from that um, or are required to have a license. So one of the things that, um, for instance, uh, there's certain local requirements around service departments or um, hotel apartments. If you have to have a license to have that, so say for instance you have 10 of those properties, at that point um, DED requires you to have a license or the land, um, uh, the tourism department requires you to have a license to conduct uh, that business, then that income becomes uh, subject to corporate tax. But if you only own residential property, for instance, and you are, or you own a whole building of apartments, it doesn't matter how many you have, it's whether or not that activity is conducted with or is required to be conducted with a license. Thank you so much, clear enough. Moving to the uh, next question, Zubair. When is a natural person obliged to obtain a license for real estate investment activities? So, this is... Uh, Put simply, this is not something which is specified in the corporate tax law. The corporate tax position is after the fact. So whether you have or should have a license is covered in the federal or the emirate level legislation. That's not something we specify. For corporate tax, for natural persons, specifically whether you should or whether you have or you should have a, a, a license uh, to engage in those activities. So it's not something which is specified under the corporate tax law itself. Thank you so much, clear enough. Moving to the next question, uh, Rada. What are the conditions for an immovable property measures on historical cost basis to avail the benefits from the transitional rule as per ministerial decision number 120? So thank you, Rada. So basically for an immovable property to be considered as a qualifying immovable property under uh, the relevant ministerial decision, uh, 120 of 2023, the immovable property should be acquired before the first CT period. It should be valued in financial statement at a historical cost, and it should be sold or deemed to be sold during the first CT period or after the first CT period at a gain comparing to, uh, so should be sold at a value exceeding the net book value. And of course, for that purpose, we need always, first of all, to determine what is your first CT period and then the, uh, uh, the rule related to the uh, qualifying immobile pro property will be determined based on that. So first we determine what is the first city period, and then if your immobile property is acquired before the first city period, valued at historical costs in your financial statement, uh, sold uh, during the first city period or after that at a value exceeding the net book value, then it will be considered as a qualifying immobile property, and then we can choose one of the methods that we saw in order to uh, determine the excluded gain. And uh, of course, the uh, choice should be based uh, on an election that happens in the first, when filing the first corporate tax uh, return. Thank you so much, clear enough. Moving back to Juliana. Is income generated from commercial buildings subject to UAE corporate tax? Thank you, Rude, for this one. Uh, in this case, first step is to look who is the taxable person. If we are talking about juridical persons, as we saw, any commercial buildings owned or managed by a juridical person will be subject to corporate taxes. 
for juridical non-resident persons in the case of a creation or deemed there is a permanent establishment or in the case of a nexus in the UAE. If there is a movable property, we notice there is a nexus in the UAE, therefore it will be subject to corporate tax. And in the case of natural person, we saw there is the exception of real estate investment income for natural persons, but if the natural person is required to have a license or has a conducting its business under a license, then will be subject to tax. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, moving back to Zubir. What are the UAE corporate tax imp implications on rental income received by a natural person that is a beneficiary of a family foundation that elected to be an un unincorporated partnership? Thank you. So family foundations are covered under Article 17 of the corporate tax law. And if an application is made and approved by the FTA, then they will be treated as a, a transparent, fiscally transparent entity and taxed as a, an unincorporated partnership would be. Therefore, the income would flow through to the beneficiaries and it would be taxed in the hands of the beneficiaries, so they would be taxed in the hands of the natural persons. And so the relevant exclusions will also be applicable to those natural persons. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Rida is a manufacturing company that realizes rental income from a property required to pay corporate tax on the rental income? Thank you, Roda. So basically for a, a company that is, um, you know, a resident person incorporated in the UAE, for example, uh, of course, rental income will be included in the uh, taxable base for corporate tax purposes. So the exclusion of the real estate income um, under Cabinet Decision 49, it is applicable only to, uh, to natural person, to individuals. Uh, and then any corporate entity that will get, um, you know, rental income, uh, it will be subject to uh, tax in general, and this will be included in the taxable base. Thank you so much, Rida. Christine, is it mandatory for a natural person who realized REI income in the UAE to register for corporate tax? Okay, so here this question is asking whether or not the, if you've uh, been able to avail of the real estate investment um, exclusion, it means that any of the income that you've generated from real estate is not included in the turnover calculation. So we went through what's included in the turnover calculation. REI is one of the exclusions. So regardless of the amount of income that you make, if that is the only income that you are making, then your turnover is essentially zero and you're not required to register for corporate tax. If you are a natural person and you have other businesses though, so not related to the real estate, say for instance, um, you uh, run a bakery or uh, provide some consulting services on the side, then that's the income that uh, may trigger your obligation to register for corporate tax if, again, it's over a million dirhams. But if all the income that you make is just in relation to real estate investment, uh, then you're not required to register. Thank you so much, clear enough. Uh, Rida, how can a sole establishment register for corporate tax? Thank you, Rida. So basically for a sole establishment, we need to distinguish between two situations. The first situation is sole establishment that is uh, related to a natural person. And then in that case, there is no distinction between the natural person and the sole establishment. So for the first tax period for a natural person, which is the year 2024, we need to determine, uh, or the natural person needs to determine whether he reached the 1 million threshold. If he reached, we would reach the, reach the 1 million threshold, then he would be required to register uh, within three months after the end of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Gregorian calendar year, which is the first uh, tax period, which is 2024. So what is realized by a natural person in 2023 is not uh, uh, subject to uh, corporate tax. Now we have situation where we have a, a sole establishment. So the license, for example, raised to a sole establishment. But in fact, it's uh, a limited liability company, limited liability company with 100% of the uh, interest owned by a natural person. But we see that on the license, uh, it is mentioned that a sole establishment LLC. In that case, it is not a natural person, it is a juridical person. It's a, a corporate entity, it's a juridical person, 
and the, uh, the uh, rules that are applicable are not the ones that are relevant for natural persons, so the exclusion, the one million threshold, the, uh, the, the, the fact that the first tax period is the Gregorian calendar year starting from 2024, all of this will not apply in that case, and we will look at it as a juridical person, despite the fact that it's uh, owned by just one uh, single natural person. And then, of course, the registration process should take place, uh, you know, on the uh, Imara tax uh, platform, as mentioned by uh, Christine. Thank you so much. Moving back to Christine. In 2024, a natural person started a new business through an LLC where he owns 100% of the capital singer, single owner LLC. Should the natural person register for corporate tax purposes? So actually this just follows on to the example that um, uh, Rita gave. So if it's a single owner LLC, it means that the natural person and the juridical, the, as in they're two separate people, they're two separate taxable persons. And so at that point there, the uh, single um, uh, owner LLC, even if it's owned 100% by the natural person, they will need to register. Um, and the natural person will not need to register in that situation. Um, because if, for instance, they're only receiving rental income from the um, LLC, um, or the, uh, the management, the, the, the LLC is just providing management services and giving the income from the rental that it's collecting from any of the tenants, for instance, um, then that will most likely be um, real estate investment income and be excluded from the turnover. So the natural person won't need to register, but the LLC will need to register. Thank you so much. Clear enough. Uh, moving to Zubair. A non-resident company purchased a warehouse in Sharjah on 15 January of 2024 and rents the warehouse to a UAE industrial company from 1st of March 2025. Is the non-resident company required to register for corporate tax purposes and what is the deadline for the registration? Thank you, a really good question. Uh, I'm going to break this down slightly. So the first part is it's a non-resident company. So that's Article 11.4. It's not considered resident even, so it's not effectively managed or controlled. It's not incorporated here. It's a non-resident company subject to Article 11, Clause 4. And then we turn to Cabinet Decision 56, which determines when a nexus exists. And a nexus is not simply having a movable property. It's when you earn, the wording of Cabinet Decision 56 is earning income from a movable property. So here, whilst they purchased the warehouse on the 15th of January in 2024, they are earning the income from the 1st of March 2025 and that's when they have a nexus. Now the last part of the answer to this question is FTA decision 3 of 2024 which provides the corporate tax deadlines for registration as Christine mentioned earlier and for a non-resident nexus it's three months from establishing a nexus. So three months from the 1st of March 2025 is when they will have to register for corporate tax. Thank you so much, Zubair. Christine, is corporate tax registration mandatory even if my taxable income is less than 375,000 dirhams and I'm not registered for that? Uh, so again, depends on whether or not you're a natural person or a juridical person, so it's not specified here. But if, for instance, you're a juridical person, the 375,000 is not a threshold for registration. It's a threshold for being, the, it's a tax-free threshold essentially. So if you are a business, regardless of whether or not you've made one dirham or not, um, say for instance, you're in the startup phase, you still do need to register. And the 375,000 is just how much taxable income you can make that's tax-free. If you're a natural person, again, you've got to consider your turnover and not the 375,000 threshold. So if you're making, if you're conducting a business, if you have a turnover over a million um, dirhams, then you're required to register. Thank you so much. And sorry, just to add the last, answer the last yeah. part, and I'm not registered for VAT. So VAT registration and CT registration are two separate things. Um, so if you are already registered for VAT, the, tax uh, the CT registration process should be a lot simpler and you'll receive the same number, but the last digit of that will change to a one. 
So for that, it's a three at the moment, um, or three. Uh, if you're registered for corporate tax, it will become a one. Thank you so much, uh, Christine. Uh, Rida, can an owner of a sole establishment pay themselves a salary and deduct it as an expense? Thank you. So basically, the, um, the owner of a sole establishment, which is a natural person, uh, if they withdraw amount from their business, they would not be able to deduct this amount. And this is based on the express uh, black letter of the law, Article 33, Clause 5 of the Corporate Tax Law. And the same would apply also for a partner uh, in an unincorporated partnership where he withdrew uh, amounts from that uh, unincorporated partnership. Thank you so much. Juliana, what are the allowable tax depreciation rates on fixed assets? Thank you, Ruda. Uh, so for this one, first we're going to look at the accounting method. So if the taxable person is, using, is making use of the accrual basis of accounting, then they're going to um, record all the depreciation, and then this depreciation recorded will be considered. There's no specific tax rate in the legislation. Whereas if the taxable person use the cash base of accounting, since it's a more simplified method, there's no specific uh, rate for depreciation either. Thank you. Thank you so much. Christine, if a natural person's taxable income does not exceed million dirhams, are they required to register and file a tax return? So again, we're look, uh, looking at the, the million dirham thresholds, but this time it's referring to taxable income. So again, there's different, uh, I guess, throughout the law, there's references to turnover, there's references to revenue, um, there's references to taxable income. So in terms of registration uh, for a natural person, it's key to look at your turnover first, and the turnover is the million dirham threshold. Um, if your taxable income is uh, over 375,000 for a natural person, then um, you, the first 375,000 is tax-free. But in terms of registration requirements, it's looking at your turnover and how to calculate your turnover. That's the important trigger for whether or not you need to register. Thank you so much, uh, Christine, Zubair, Juliana, and Rida. Um, we would like to ask you now to open your cameras and scan the QR code, please, to let us hear your feedback about today's workshop and what recommendations or topics you would like to hear in future workshops. We will give you one minute to open your camera and scan the QR code, please. Thank you so much for participating in the survey. As you can see, we have tried to answer as many as questions as we can. However, since our time is up and we are coming to the end of, the, of this insightful and dynamic workshop, I want to assure you that the FTA team will make sure that, re that the remaining questions are addressed and we are required updated in the F FAQs at the FTA's website. FTA will host similar workshops across various emirates, and you can view the workshop schedule and details through the FTA's website and by following the FTA social media platforms. Rest assured, there will be more sessions, more educational materials, and other awareness activities in the coming weeks and months. To stay tuned, make sure you follow the FTA on social media. I hope that this awareness workshop was beneficial for you. And please make sure to stamp your valet ticket before you leave by the registration desk. Thank you so much and have a great day.